The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us today. Our webinar will be starting shortly, ending the HIV epidemic, equitable access, everyone's voice. Just give a minute and we'll get started. We'll get started in one moment for World AIDS Day, ending the HIV epidemic, a call to action, a role for community health centers in ending the HIV epidemic. Well, welcome everyone to today's World AIDS Day, ending the HIV epidemic, and we all have a role to play in ending the HIV epidemic. It is a call to action and the role that community health centers can play in ending the HIV epidemic. We have a great presentation for you today. The presentation will be recorded, and if you have questions to ask, please ask those questions. There's two ways. You can raise your hand or you could put a question in your chat for our speakers today. So thank you on behalf of Alliance Chicago and Health Choice Network and our partners uh, joining us in World AIDS Day today. So if we advance the slide, we have a couple of uh, conversations going on today. First, we're gonna hear from our colleague, Dr. Kenneth Mayer, about strategies to boost access to PrEP. Then myself, Dr. Timothy Long, will talk a call to action the role in community health centers can play in ending the HIV epidemic. And then we're going to hear from one of our healthcare heroes at one of our health centers, Angel Camacho, talking about empower use fight to end the HIV epidemic. And then if people have questions, um, you can ask questions after each one of the speakers or at the end also. Again, today's record, uh, webinar will be recorded. We will have a little poll um, question and interaction coming up. So please uh, pay attention with your cell phone. But first, I want to turn it over to our colleague, Ken, Dr. Mayer, who is going to talk with us about some strategies to boost people's access to PrEP. So Dr. Mayer, how are you today? Take it away. I'm doing well, Tim. Th thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So uh, I, I've known Dr. Long in his various incarnations uh, um, with HCN and before that with Howard Brown, and we've been collaborators on a couple of um, research studies. I'm the medical research director at Fenway Health, also teach at Harvard Medical School, and my focus is biobehavioral um, HIV prevention. So I'm hope, hoping in this talk to uh, sort of review where we are with, um, with um, uh, PrEP and to think about how we can make it more accessible, uh, particularly to sexual gender minority people. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, just some key facts about PrEP. Um, this, this uh, meta-analysis looked at um, a bunch of demonstration projects, almost 50, and basically found that you know, PrEP in the real world is not 100% effective, but highly effective when you think about the rates of HIV infection in high-risk populations. Uh, uh, but clearly, we can do better. Uh, the highest rate of incident infections in these demonstration projects were in transgender women. And um, a, a lot of qualitative studies have shown that there's still a lot of medical mistrust concerns about drug interaction. So clearly, uh, even within sexual gender minority communities, uh, there are populations who've accessed PrEP more effectively uh, than others. And that's part of the work is really uh, educating uh, the community. Uh, many people in the beginning, uh, when PrEP first came out, said, gee, well, you're giving uh, medication on a chronic basis to people who are otherwise healthy. Is that a good thing? 
but uh, this meta-analysis showed that the, the rate of adverse events is really not substantially different uh, than uh, placebo. So it's really safe and well tolerated. Clearly, we have to monitor creatinine because uh, some people can get creatinine elevations. They tend to be uh, reversible. Uh, there can be decreased bone mineral density, but that's really um, not uh, generally of uh, clinical significance. So for the most part, this is a safe medication that people can tolerate, and the big challenges are persistence and adherence. Next slide, please. Um, so with regard uh, to whether PrEP has an impact in the real world, these are data from several cities around uh, the world, and then um, um, in rural Kenya and Uganda more recently. And basically, you can't say that this is PrEP by itself decreasing um, HIV incidence, because there's also treatment as prevention. Uh, and these are places that also scaled up treatment. But the combination of, of scaling up treatment and PrEP has had a profound impact in places where it's really been undertaken at a serious level. So it, it definitely has a community level um, impact when, when scaled up fully. Next slide, please. So the, the next set of issues uh, to recognize is we've got a big PrEP gap in the United States. Uh, less than 30% of people who could benefit from PrEP have utilized PrEP. Um, and that's really um, a challenge. Uh, next slide. And we know that there are a lot of disparities in PrEP use as well. So for a number of years, we've been looking at why some men who have sex with men have not been using PrEP. And it's not a single narrative. Um, um, some people have structural issues like uh, concerns about cost or experiences with cost, access, and insurance. Uh, other people, it's anticipated side effects. And some people are just uh, not really recognizing uh, their risks. So it's not one size fits all if we're going to really scale up PrEP. We have to think about the different uh, populations and the different issues. Next slide, please. So uh, with regard to um, persistence, this is another challenge. So these are data from um, um, people who have commercial insurance. So it's, um, presumably, uh, finances should not be the major sticking point for them being able to stay on PrEP. And yet, yet you can see attenuation over time. And you can particularly see in the uh, dark blue line that it's um, um, highest for young individuals. So uh, again, it's not just starting PrEP because you know taking the pill once is not the answer if somebody's risk is ongoing. It's figuring out how to sustain a health habit that this becomes uh, a part of a normal uh, preventive behavior for an individual if the risk uh, continues over time. Next slide, please. So some of the um, ways in which we think we might be able to overcome some of the barriers are new formulations. Uh, just like with uh, hormonal contraception, uh, there are pills, there are gels, there are uh, rings, there are implants. And the same thing is being uh, starting to be tested with regard to, uh, to free exposure prophylaxis. Next slide, please. So one, one approach is um, um, giving uh, a different form of tenofovir, and this is uh, FTAF or tenofovir alafenamide. Um, and this has been shown to be uh, uh, least as protective against HIV. And there's some relative benefits, but it's a much more expensive medication. So, so clearly the mainstay in the US is gonna be um, FTDF uh, or um, uh, Trabata, but now that's available generically, which is why it's much cheaper. But, um, but and TAF has been associated with modest lipid uh, increases and weight gain. So those would be populations where you might want to avoid it. Um, but on the other hand, individuals uh, um, who um, have renal or bone disease, one might want to consider using it. But that's a, a small um, distinction and not necessarily going to make a big difference in uh, rolling out PrEP. Next slide, please. But then there are uh, the issue of the 211. And this was uh, an approach that the French first studied, in a study called Ipergay. Uh, and this is um, asking people to take two pills within 24 hours of sex uh, and a pill a day for two days afterwards. And this is based on the pharmacology. And these data basically show that uh, um, when they went from uh, a randomized trial um, done several years ago with placebo, then basically giving uh, French uh, men who have sex with men the choice, would you rather take daily? Would you rather take um, on demand? About, it was about 50-50, about half, half went with one, half went with the other. And the bottom line was that there were very few infections. There were only two infections um, in each group with more than 2,500 person years of follow-up. So extremely low um, HIV um, incidence, less than uh, or about one in a thousand. Uh, and they estimate that even in a year follow-up, they um, averted um, several hundred uh, new HIV infections. So 211 is def definitely works. It's not yet officially approved uh, by the CDC, but they're considering revising their guidelines. And, but this is a, a, an approach that is particularly useful for people 
who are um, who know when they're going to have sex, uh, so they can predict when they're going to have sex, and are highly adherent. Because if you miss the pre doses, then it's a problem. Then then you're giving post exposure prophylaxis. Somebody starts taking medication after a high risk exposure, which is not optimal. So it, it's definitely something as clinicians we can counsel some people if they prefer to take less medication. But it's understanding their patterns of sex, their patterns of being able to know when they're having sex, and their patterns of adherence that may be a solution. Uh, next slide, please. But another approach is um, thinking about uh, the hormonal contraceptive model. And for uh, uh, cisgender uh, women, uh, um, uh, trans men engaging in frontal sex um, who are at risk for HIV, uh, there is a ring that has been studied now uh, in several large studies in Africa and has been shown that at least for a subpopulation of women, uh, when they find it highly acceptable and are adherent, it, it offers a modest protective benefit. Uh, some women um, didn't like it because they felt that their partners could feel the ring uh, or they could feel it during intercourse. So it's not going to be perfect for everyone, but it is um, the first product that um, a regulatory body approved that's not a pill. Uh, EMA is the European Medicine Association, and they've approved it now, uh, and several African countries have. And the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is reviewing uh, the dossier for this as well. So that should be available sometime soon. Next slide, please. But the big game changer uh, is injectable PrEP. Uh, this is medication cabotegravir. It's an integrated strand transfer inhibitor. And two studies, uh, one that we were involved in, HP10083, and then uh, which, which uh, enrolled men with sex with men and transgender women. And then HP10084 uh, conducted uh, primarily in Africa enrolled cisgender uh, women. And, and both studies found that actually getting an injection of this medication every two months was superior to daily oral medication. And that's because the daily oral medication, there was a subset of people who were not adherent, whereas most people showed up for the shots. Uh, next slide, please. But it's important, there are a couple of lessons about this from HP10083. It's not the perfect answer for everybody because um, even in a clinical trial where you have more um, people who might be more motivated to be adherent, um, over 2% of individuals discontinued because they felt the in injections were uncomfortable. So it's not going to work for people who don't like needles. Also, uh, there were 12 incident HIV infections in the, on the arm of people who got the, um, inject the active injections, the cabotegravir. Um, and eight of these were people who already were HIV infected or were non-adherent. Uh, so one key thing here is, um, you know, because people may be in the so-called window period before they start PrEP, in other words, they might have had sex a, a day or uh, the night before, and it's not going to be possible uh, with an antibody test to pick up HIV infection. So this speaks to the fact that when you're giving a long-acting medication, you really want to be sure the person's HIV uninfected before starting the medication. There were a couple people, literally two out of 2,500 people who got the active medication, uh, where there's not a good explanation. And, and that raises questions about whether when you give an injection, whether some of the medication could get sequestered and not um, be evenly distributed throughout the body for uh, as long a period of time. So there's still things we have to find out about this, but the overall take home is that the vast majority of people uh, who, who got the injections did show up on a regular basis. When they showed up on a regular basis, they had a very high level of protection. Uh, it was rare to find uh, uh, any of these people who uh, were failures to develop integrated strand transfer inhibitor resistance, but there were a couple. So again, it speaks to really trying to be uh, watch individuals uh, who are on this medication like a hawk, because certainly if they're not showing up at the two month visit and then they engage in risky sex uh, at uh, three months or four months and then come back, you wanna make sure that they haven't become HIV infected in the meantime, because of that long half-life of the medication, it'll still be in the body for a while. Um, Integrase fan transfer inhibitors as a class can be associated with modest weight gain. So that's something to consider uh, in some patient populations. And again, the vast majority of the incident infections in the uh, um, tenofovir and tricytabine arm were because of people not being adherent. So it's the injection has an advantage in terms of um, adherence and definitely is a new modality. And this, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is going to be reviewing this dossier in um, uh, January. So we may have uh, FDA approval um, early in the new year uh, for this other approach for PrEP. So that's one thing is, is trying to make the medication more convenient for people. Next slide, please. But there are a number of other things that we should be thinking about as well to improve the cascade. So one issue I mentioned in the beginning was um, 
uh, the cost of, of things. So uh, drug assistance programs and uh, several of the states that you're in, Illinois, uh, where I am, Massachusetts, uh, the state does have a drug assistance program. And the reason for this is that, you know, there are a lot of programs where the medication may be paid for, but then the uh, monitoring might not be paid for. And for people who are on PrEP, we want to make sure that they don't um, have um, treatable sexually transmitted infections. But screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, doing all three mucosal sites that somebody might be exposed, and doing that uh, four times a year, that's more than $1,000. So that, that may be a deal breaker for some people who don't have that covered, or the cost of the clinician visits. So um, support for programs is one PrEP intervention. Academic detailing, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Doug Krakauer, talked about the purview paradox, that people who are primary care docs feel like I'm not used to uh, prescribing antiretrovirals. Um, HIV specialists say, well, gee, I'm only used to taking care of people with HIV, not people who are not infected. And so there's a lot of um, pointing the finger at the other, other person. And um, academic detailing is a way of uh, um, having uh, trained uh, educators coming into clinics and helping work with providers to feel more comfortable about um, providing PrEP. We really need to think of this as creating a new professional prevention workforce. Uh, you're going to hear uh, from Angel about uh, um, uh, PrEP navigation, which is definitely important. The, the role of community, the role of peers is extremely important for, for PrEP support. And then there are a number of resources online. The one I really like the best is AVAC, uh, which has a lot of good graphics and um, updates and information. Next slide, please. But I'd like to tell you about a few other things uh, that we have to keep in mind. We don't have one HIV epidemic in the country. We have uh, multiple sub-epidemics. Uh, one population that's been particularly heavily impacted have been black men who have sex with men. And uh, a colleague, Dr. Laron Nelson, has developed a, a curriculum that's culturally tailored uh, for black men uh, called Culturally Tailored uh, Client-Centered Care Coordination. And a uh, pilot study in the HIV Prevention Trials Network it was found to be associated with a high level of acceptability uh, and um, more PrEP uptake and persistence in PrEP. Uh, so there may be ways to culturally tailor PrEP so that it's more acceptable for different communities. And then uh, the challenge for youth, um, the Adolescent Trials Network, the ATN, uh, did two studies. Uh, They're basically the same trial, just one was in 15, 16, 17 year olds, and the other was 18 to 22 year olds. And they, it looked at whether PrEP plus an individual uh, intervention versus a group intervention uh, led to better adherence. And unfortunately, the answer was that uh, uh, there was bad adherence in, in both groups. Uh, the youth were modestly adherent for the first three months when they were asked to come into the clinic on a monthly basis. But by the third month when the visits were quarterly, uh, adherence dropped off substantially. So we have to think about better ways to uh, make PrEP accessible uh, to youth. And I'll talk about a couple approaches uh, that people are thinking about in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, so one, one way is uh, since everybody spends all their time on their phone or other devices these days, is thinking about how do we use new technologies to promote PrEP adherence. Uh, the thinking about this goes back more than a decade. There's a study uh, written up in The Lancet that showed uh, for people living with HIV in Western Kenya, if they got a text message once a week, they're more likely to be virally suppressed. Uh, there are devices to measure adherence. There's something called a WISE pill, which is uh, basically a, a pill box that um, tells a clinician when the medication was taken. But, that's not necessarily um, acceptable outside of a research study. Uh, there have been um, tailored interventions. I've worked with a behavioral scientist, uh, Dr. Steve Safran, and we've used uh, SMS text messaging and also nurse delivered uh, PrEP um, counseling support and have had very good results. And the CDC has promoted this as an evidence-based intervention. Um, there also are uh, electronic diaries uh, that have been studied and feedback on drug levels uh, so, uh, to tell people gee, we noticed you haven't been taking the medication and maybe that helps have a conversation about adherence. And then there are a number of different apps that are being developed to help people track their sexual behavior and their pill taking behavior. Um, none of this is completely ready for prime time, but this is sort of an area where uh, the field is going. Certainly in the short run uh, for a busy community health center, um, certainly uh, if, if there's uh, a uh, nurse or um, a peer uh, who wants to send people text messages on a weekly basis, uh, the data suggests that that can possibly help. It certainly cannot hurt. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then uh, when we um, think about um, U.S. Uh, Public Health Service guidelines on PrEP, it's, it's not the most complicated intervention. It's, you know, you want to make sure somebody's not HIV infected. 
want to screen kidney function and uh, check for SDIs and hepatitis, and then and then give the medication. If you keep clicking again, please, um, there are two more bullets. Yeah, then you prescribe it and one more. And and basically, um, you want to monitor people and maintain a relationship. You know, but again, it, um, there are things that um, may require a face-to-face -face visit. We think of traditionally like the SDI screening, but a lot of this, particularly in our pandemic era, could be done uh, remotely. So next slide, please. So with a colleague, Dr. Um, Aaron Siegler and I, we've been um, looking at remote PrEP monitoring. Now, now one approach is uh, somebody comes in the clinic and they're high risk, um, you know, can they uh, start PrEP right away? And the New York uh, City Health Department uh, in their sexual health clinics actually looked at this and they basically found that um, uh, uh, everybody who came in for an SDI screen, so almost by definition, they were risky. Uh, they asked them a few questions about kidney history, uh, whether they had prior hepatitis B infection, and they found that if people said no to all those things, um, they um, um, basically um, offered them PrEP and the vast majority of people stayed on PrEP and only four people they had to subsequently discontinue when uh, they did a, a rapid te a test uh, for HIV. And they also uh, pooled blood to look at whether RNA was uh, present in, in the group of people. There were only two people who, had, uh, who were acutely HIV infected. There are two people whose kidney function meant that they probably shouldn't be taking um, um, uh, to uh, offer um, physoproxyl fumarate TDF, um, uh, the more common version of PrEP. Uh, so they had to be stopped. Uh, uh, people who's, um, who said, gee, I have, I have a problem or I'm not ready to start PrEP, there's a small number, but they found that um, the vast majority of those people did not, did not start uh, PrEP as much as the people who, um, who were offered same day. So same day is one approach. Uh, then next slide. Then the other approach uh, in terms of simplifying PrEP has to do with the pandemic. So you can see here at Fenway that when the pandemic hit in March uh, 2020, we immediately started doing telemedicine and teleprep. And by April, this was the normative thing that we've uh, been doing. Next slide, please. And ironically, uh, with um, Aaron Siegler, we've been uh, doing a study uh, which started uh, um, in 2015, a pilot study. And now we're in the middle of a large study in uh, Boston, um, Atlanta, Jackson, Mississippi, St. Louis, and uh, Cleveland. And we're, we're actually looking at half the individuals are randomized to have complete remote PrEP monitoring. They actually get a kit at home, which uh, tells them how to swab uh, their different mucous membranes and uh, put the swabs in the appropriate tubes and prick their finger. Uh, and uh, we can um, use filter paper to um, uh, test for uh, syphilis and test for HIV and test for creatinine. And so we're, uh, our pilots uh, found that this was highly acceptable for the majority of people. And now we're going to see whether we can show that definitively in, the, in this larger uh, study. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, the, you know, the last set of issues are really, uh, we as clinicians really can create a more favorable environment for PrEP. So there have been people who've been very paranoid about PrEP saying, you know, it's going to select for resistance and it's going to make people riskier. But the bottom line is that people who want PrEP are people who are either not using condoms already or don't want to be using condoms necessarily. And uh, isn't it better to have them not become HIV infected? Uh, so the real issue is, can we match the risk and the, um, the adherence? Because if somebody's highly adherent to PrEP, the data says it's going to protect you. And if they come in regularly for their SCI screening, we may pick up SCI sooner than we would if they weren't on PrEP and they thought that they were doing just fine. So I think we really have to um, you know, ma match things. Obviously, if somebody is not willing to commit to being adherent, uh, that's a different story and that's more problematic because we certainly don't want them to be taking the medicine on an ad hoc basis and potentially get infected and select for resistance. But fortunately, that is rare and uh, there's so much good that PrEP can do for people uh, when uh, prescribed and uh, when people um, engage in, in PrEP care. Next slide, please. Uh, and you know, I mentioned before, this is just this purview paradox that really um, is the challenge. And you know, um, those of you on the call are obviously interested in this topic, and hopefully, will become um, um, advocates for um, this this approach for thinking about prep as a normal part of uh, clinical practice. I, I talk about taking a sexual history as the fifth vital sign, and one of the conclusions, and you take a sexual history, is you might determine somebody's at high risk for HIV, and those are people who would benefit from prep. Next slide, please. Um, and um, my colleague, uh, Doug Krakauer, said, well, it's very complicated for busy clinicians to ask everybody everything all the time. 
So he looked uh, at an HMO in the great, uh, greater Boston area called Atreus Health, and looking at the electronic medical records, about 800,000 patients, um, the clinic had about 885 HIV infected patients and about 250 people who are currently on PrEP. And he was able to say, well, who are the high-risk people? And next slide. And the way you can determine high-risk people, uh, there are a number of different things in, in, clinical, um, in, in clinical practice. And that's, you can look at the demographics. Uh, please keep clicking. You can look at lab results. You can look at diagnoses and prescriptions. And in other words, you know, um, um, somebody who's younger may be at more risk for HIV. Somebody who just had a, um, a screening test for syphilis is probably somebody to talk to about, about PrEP. Somebody who has um, uh, a diagnosis of um, um, uh, other sexually transmitted infections, probably a good um, person for PrEP. Somebody who has had a script filled uh, last uh, few months for post-exposure prophylaxis is a good candidate for PrEP. So what Doug is trying to do is trying to develop prompts in the electronic medical record to see if that'll influence clinical behavior so that a clinician doesn't have to feel like, oh my God, I don't have any time. I have to um, talk to all these patients every day and the majority of these people are not PrEP candidates. So if we can use the um, EHR in a more sophisticated way to help prompt us, uh, it may be this, you know, the same, you know, everybody gets too many prompts as it is as a busy clinician, but um, you know, um, one more prompt in addition, it's time for this person's uh, uh, pneumovax or flu vaccine would be, you know, gee, this person just um, had this new infection. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk to them about PrEP? Um, next slide, please. So it's, you know, it's it's um, not a simple matter. Um, we are seeing increases in sexually transmitted infections uh, in the era of PrEP, but it's not only just PrEP. Uh, it's also the fact that we have U equals U. People who are uninfected, uh, excuse me, who are undetected will, will be um, not infecting other individuals, untransmittable, and, and that's really important as well. Next slide, please. Uh, what we saw at Fenway when we looked at the first decade of PrEP was that by 2015, you can see in the red bar, a good chunk of people with new SDIs were people on PrEP, but the green bar is even bigger, and that's people who are HIV uninfected and not on PrEP, who you could argue should be on PrEP, and the blue um, are people who are living with HIV who wouldn't be PrEP candidates, so you can't just blame PrEP by itself. It's um, the whole environment of people meeting partners online. Um, and also we're doing more screening now of extra genital sites. So there's uh, more ascertainment of SDIs as well. And next slide, please. Um, and one last com concept I wanna leave you with is um, we shouldn't just see PrEP as one more um, um, obligation that busy primary care providers have to deal with. But at Fenway, we looked at um, in the same age group of uh, men accessing primary care at Fenway, we compared the PrEP users and the non-users uh, over a five-year period. And we found that if you were a PrEP user, you're more likely to get a flu vaccine, you're more likely to be screened for tobacco, have depression screening, um, and have some form of diabetes screening. And so our argument is that uh, just like for women, uh, young women of reproductive age, uh, in, in engagement in reproductive health services is a way to also get uh, blood pressure taken and uh, diabetes screening. And similarly, uh, for men who have sex with men who, um, and other sexual gender minority people who may um, not be coming to clinic on a regular basis if it wasn't for PrEP, but by virtue of coming in on a regular basis, they're engaging with a primary care provider who can say, oh, you're due for your flu shot. And that, uh, so it's a win-win in that circumstance. So thinking of PrEP as a gateway to primary care, I think is an important additional concept uh, next slide, please. And with that, I just want to say, you know, we, we think more holistically. The first part of the puzzle is getting more testing done for HIV and bacterial SCIs. That's what BSCI is. And then if people test positive, um, um, linking them into care and getting them onto medication virally suppressed. If they're um, uninfected, not everybody needs to go on PrEP, but assessing their risk. And we have to realize that what drives risk and non-adherence are other issues like depression, substance use, relationship dynamics and structural and social issues. So if we get it all right, we will see a decrease in both HIV and bacterial SCI transmission. Uh, next slide, I believe last slide. I just want to, uh, yeah, and just want to thank my uh, colleagues who helped inform this talk. And thank you, uh, uh, Tim, for the invitation to speak to folks today. Oh, wow, Ken, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was uh, some great information. Um, and some of it I had not heard. And I really, really like this idea of the gateway to primary care as you know we're we're tailoring our conversation here 
to the busy primary care clinician who, who might not be doing um, HIV medicine, um, but this is, that's great. And I really, um, uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you next year about the injectable possibility. That would be really great. So I, if there's anyone who would like to um, unmute uh, their line or uh, type in a question into the chat for Ken, um, that would be great. He'll be able to stay with us for about 25 more minutes. Um, and if not, um, we will be able to email him some questions later. But Ken, I want to thank you from the from the bottom of my heart uh, for joining us today. It's truly, I think, for, for yourself and myself who, you know, I started my medical career at Cook County Hospital in the early 90s and um, like many other clinicians doing this work, to be able to be sitting here today talking about ending the HIV epidemic when I started my medical career about how you help people end their life with dignity. Um, it's really been a full circle. So this is a great conversation. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Tim. So as we move along to um, uh, the next presentation, uh, my name is, uh, as I mentioned, Tim Long, and I'm a primary care internist, and I, I uh, focus on HIV medicine and urban environment. I've worked at the same community health center for many, many years, and then I've had a number of roles um, at, with Ken, fortunately, in some research areas, and also as a chief medical officer. So I thought it'd be important today to talk about how federally qualified community health centers can play a role in ending the HIV epidemic. So if you're a clinician, a clinician leader, or a nurse, or anyone interested in helping to end the HIV epidemic, we thought there'd be a few things that we should um, know about the national uh, strategy. So I think on the next slide, um, this is a document that I think everyone should get and, and look at, at least look at the summary of this. You know, the federal government has this national strategic plan. It does lay out a framework um, and a way in which we and community health centers can work with our research partners like Ken, academic institutions, and other funders, uh, not only the federal government, state, and other um, local departments or boards of health, to make sure that we are part of this um, ending the HIV epidemic. And this strategy, as you can see on this slide, was put together um, with a number of offices, federal offices, uh, putting in their input into this. So it's not just uh, one part of the federal government, it's a number of parts of the federal government. And I think on the next slide, it'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the background here. So the uh, National HIV Strategy, or the Strategic Plan, first started in 2010 under President Obama and Vice President Biden administration. And it really was a, um, a way to first talk about the possibility of ending the HIV epidemic, which at that time, um, you know, I thought, think people thought it was crazy. Uh, but here we are 10 or 11 years later, and it's a real possibility. And then every year that, or every five years, that strategy has been updated. And my, my colleague, Kwesi, um, told me that the uh, the new plan just came out today, so this might be a little bit delayed, uh, the plan, but the National St uh, Strategic Plan really is aggressive in the sense that we want to reduce new HIV infections by 75% uh, by the year 2025 and by 90% by the year 2030. So in the next slide, um, the vision, I think, is extremely important, and I, I'm a firm believer in federally qualified community health centers, mission and vision, and here you'll see the vision for the HIV National Strategic Plan, um, that the United States will be a place where new HIV infections are prevented, every person knows their status, and every person with HIV has high quality care and treatment and lives free from stigma and discrimination. And within that vision, um, at least I and probably others within the community health center movement and mission can see that this to be a true reality. We are really at the cusp of that, and that's why we thought that it'd be important to talk about uh, the strategic plan today. So on the next slide, there are uh, four um, strategic goals in the national strategic plan. So the first one is preventing new infections. So how do we go about doing that? And Ken talked um, about some of those uh, ways just a moment ago. Number two is improving the HIV-related health outcomes of people with HIV. So if you become HIV positive, how can you stay healthy? 
And then number three is reducing HIV-related disparities and health inequities. We have seen, as Ken mentioned also, um, the HIV epidemic is not the same for every community uh, in the country. And then number four, achieve integrated, coordinated efforts that address the HIV epidemic among all partners and stakeholders. So in the next slide, the focus areas are, uh, there's a number of them here, you can just slide through all of them. So number one focus area is to diagnose people with HIV as early as possible and promptly link them to care and treatment. So testing, testing, testing. Um, number two, support all people with HIV to achieve and maintain viral suppression and improve health-related quality of life as they age with HIV. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more about making sure that we maintain uh, viral suppression. And then scale up PrEP awareness and access efforts for people for whom it is indicated and desired. As Ken just mentioned, there are all kinds of new ways and new modalities to make sure that we can engage not only our patients, but also our care team members, and maybe some of those clinicians who might be working in the same hallway as us at our community health center, but don't wanna talk about um, PrEP and HIV testing and, and maybe the non-traditional group. And Ken, I really liked your, your uh, what did you call it? Academic, um, uh, academic detailing, which is great. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I might be reaching out to you to um, figure out how we can get some of our clinicians some more academic detailing. Fantastic. So and then another one is addressing stigma, discrimination, and other social and uh, structural determinants of health that inhibit HIV prevention, testing, and care. And then another focus area is really supporting um, the development and implementation of innovative approaches to mitigate the impact of viral hepatitis and other STIs. And then really the connection of past and present trauma on the uh, health outcomes for communities that are disproportionately affected by HIV and other uh, illnesses. So those focus areas are things that we can all work on, maybe not every one of them, but there are some small things that if you're not actually involved in ending the HIV epidemic today, there are members at your health center that probably would wanna be involved in one of these focus areas. So on the next slide, we will see some of these priority populations. Um, as Ken mentioned, as we probably know, uh, the HIV epidemic is not affecting everybody the same way. And here you can see on the screen that some groups uh, might need some more specific targeting um, and education or reaching out to. And truly we need to make sure that we run programs, that we hire staff and that we target um, these uh, groups differently in a message and way and manner in which they wanna hear um, the information. So if we move to the next slide, um, we're gonna see if we could ask a couple people to participate in a poll with us. I know this is gonna be a, uh, a little activity here. So if you could just take out your uh, phone, or I think you can do it on the screen too, um, but if you take out your phone and you put in the, in the message line texting 22333, and then in the message line you put in the text W, AD 2021, which is World AIDS Day 2021. I think you'll get a response back to say that you're active in the poll. Um, then we're gonna ask one uh, question here. We might ask another one in, in a few minutes, um, but then you can actively participate. And what we would like to know is which national strategic plan focus area could or is your organization working on now or first? So I think uh, if we advance the slide, I think it might come up with A, B, C, D. Let's see. Why don't we start that poll, if we could, Quasi. You might have to refresh the screen. And if not, we're live. So uh, people can put into the, into the chat um maybe uh one of those answers so again let's go back to that screen yep looks like we had a little challenge with the poll that's okay so i'll walk through them really um we what we really wanted to do here is get a commitment from someone at your health center you or or someone in your community what focus area could you work on um, or start working on it so increasing hiv uh, screening 
um, and linkage to care. The second one could be supporting HIV positive patients to achieve and maintain viral suppression, improving quality of life or scale up some PrEP awareness, access, and adherence for Black and Latino communities. Just put those in the chat if you can, or address stigma, discrimination, or other social and structural determinants of health, or apply some of these new approaches to mitigate the impact of STIs and trauma on the health outcomes of communities that are disproportionately affected. So why don't we move on? We had a little technical glimpse with our poll there, and that is quite all right. So some uh, new opportunities available in the fight to end the HIV epidemic. So a couple of things, I'm not gonna go in detail to some of the funding here, but what I think is um, you will get the slides to this presentation, and this is a hyperlink here where you can go and look at some of this funding. There is funding available. Uh, both at the federal level and state level. And then also states have been awarded a lot of this funding for local um, metropolitan areas. So just recently, you know, in February of, of 2020, Health and Human Services awarded 117 million to ending the HIV epidemic. And this was, you know, quite a bit. Remember um, in February of 2020, uh, there was a Republican administration in the White House um, and generally that might not have been a, a common thing to really put out that much money for ending the HIV epidemic, but that is true, that happened. That money is now out the door. Um, and then March of this year of 2021, HRSA awarded uh, 99 million to end the HIV epidemic through you know, Ryan White programs. Many of our federally qualified community health centers do have Ryan White funding, but not all have Ryan White funding, and but all community health centers should be doing a lot of the HIV screening from the general population, and then also linkage uh, to care. So, and then most recently, September of 2021, HRSA awarded another 48 million to health centers for ending the HIV uh, epidemic initiative. So again, I would really encourage if you are participating in some of this ending HIV epidemic funding, great partner with other organizations and community health centers and community -based organizations that might not yet be uh, partnering uh, with you on that. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at some, um, again, this is just a snapshot to say, there's money out there, $670 million for this one effort of ending the HIV epidemic. As we have been listening to here, there's a lot of different ways um, in which we can participate in ending the HIV epidemic. Go to the next slide. And this again is just a, a great resource in, in, a, in a toolkit, um, both for prevention and treatment. Um, and there's, you know, whether it's syringe service programs or pre-exposure prophylaxis programs, whatever it is, there's a, there's a lot of researchers like Ken and his team um, at the Fenway Institute and others that are able to um, help uh, give us a framework for how we can do this at our community health center. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight, um, as was mentioned earlier, I think New York City has, has done a, gr a number of great things and had some examples. And I thought this would be interesting to put in the slide here with the reference down on the bottom, just talking about how we want, we want to make sure that we test as many people as we can. Again, this is in the general population. We're definitely going to continue to test people who are at risk, but those individuals that are also maybe just in the general population, you might be a primary care physician, focusing on um, women's health or just adult or geriatric medicine, but not really thinking about HIV. You wanna make sure that all of your individuals that you see as a, as a, in, your, in your panel of patients are tested. And then here, this is just a great algorithm with the patients HIV uninfected, and they would go down um, that cascade of determining the risk, their awareness of PrEP, having the PrEP um, discussion with the provider, and if appropriate, putting the individual on PrEP. And as we have learned, there's going to be all kinds of additional options for PrEP. It's coming soon, in addition to the ones that are available today. And if an individual is HIV infected, to get them diagnosed uh, and into care and on antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible for the ultimate goal of viral suppression. And then with that, um, that is one of the main pillars of ending the HIV epidemic. So on the next slide, um, should we test this poll or not? 
my my uh, <laughs> my 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 team wants me to ask it. I guess so. We're gonna we're probably not the poll might not work, but this is what we were gonna ask you if we were able to. And so, what is the most prominent barrier to providing appropriate HIV prevention and treatment within the organization? So just think about it. What are some of the things that you think at your organization, if you're working in a community health center, what might be um, some of those prominent barriers? Is it provider hesitancy due to HIV management and screening requirement? Is it a lack of updated policies and standing orders to facilitate the process of screening and linkage to care? Or is it lack of support staff or lack of infrastructure? The reason why we put this poll in here is because we wanna help health centers um, make connections to other organizations can help with some of these barriers and also we could be part of that um, um, area part of the way to reduce those barriers at your health center and it'll both alliance chicago and health choice network both um, health center controlled networks um, we are going to be doing more and more to make sure that we are part of any of the hiv epidemic and whatever you need at your health center uh, we want to see if we can provide that. So you can always um, put that in the chat or email me or Quasi later, and we will definitely try to help you. Your workforce. Community health centers actually um, this has been a, a period of, of great expansion during this COVID, which is a horrible experience, but it's been a great expansion for community health centers in funding and hiring new workers um, within our community health center. And then definitely we wanna make sure that we diversify uh, our workforce so that we hire and maintain staff that communicate and look like and um, are members of the patients that we serve. Um, and then we wanna make sure that we include comprehensive sexual health information in our curriculum. Oftentimes we have uh, medical students and residents and maybe nurse practitioner programs or fellowship programs. We wanna make sure that we incorporate that information in their learning whenever they're at a community health center. And then certainly we wanna partner with all organizations that we can, whether Ryan White funded or not. I know there's some community health centers on the uh, webinar today that do not have Ryan White funding. Uh, but certainly we at the network level can help connect you with health centers that do have some Ryan White funding to get on that uh, that strategy. So the next strategy is, again, I, 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 we're belaboring the point, but I want to make sure that everyone hears this. And you can use these slides with some of your um, individual colleagues who might be resistant on this, but test all people for HIV according uh, to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And that does not mean it's risk-based. This means at least everyone must have at least one um, HIV test on their medical record. So you wanna make sure that you're adopting policies and promising or best practices such as opt-out. Make sure that's a written policy. We have examples of that. If you would like to um, get an example of an uh, HIV opt-out screening policy for federally qualified community health center. And then certainly establish standing orders to facilitate that facilitate that screening process. So it's not placed on the provider. I don't think we need to give um, you know, the provider all the responsibilities. Now it might be under the billable provider, but you can have standing orders to reduce provider burden. Let's go to strategy three. And this is a truly, you know, Ken mentioned this earlier and I'm a firm believer in, in Ken's ideas there. Leveraging the electronic medical record and as driving force to identify patients or clients in need of HIV tests. Use technology, use the patient portal, definitely be able to use um, different tools, population management tools, um, and the information in your medical record to identify those clients that would benefit from PrEP and other HIV prevention services. Definitely link anyone who is HIV positive uh, to care. Hopefully it's same day or near same day care. Again, we wanna get those individuals on antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible. And then correctly collect reliable testing data. We wanna make sure that we're able to talk about our data and tell our story. Strategy number four is access, um, assess organizations for unconscious bias and stigma and then address them. Um, you know, we don't know really if there's unconscious bias unless we look for it. So look for provider hesitancy in screening and treatment for HIV within your organization. 
There have been a number of studies um, done in the past on this. Uh, and so I think that that is something that might still be around and we probably want to do something about that. And some of it is um, assessing your staff's readiness on this subject. And then if we move to the next slide, uh, strategy number five, it's really combining HIV prevention with other standard of care practice. I love the, the data that was, you know, the gateway to primary care, which is awesome to start using that. Uh, bringing people in to get routine labs and routinize HIV screening, routinize uh, getting people on PrEP. Those individuals looks like they're gonna be healthier, which is great. Um, incorporated definitely into family planning and certainly for individuals like myself who have been um, doing HIV management for many, many years. I have a number of HIV positive clients and patients who are in their 70s and 80s who are alive and healthy and have HIV is not an issue. Uh, and they are not gonna die of HIV. Now they might die of other things, but they're not gonna be dying of HIV. And truly, if you do whole person care, um, that uh, we do not wanna forget about that uh, aging population. So strategy number six is really to support research in the development and evaluation of new HIV prevention modalities and interventions. As you heard from Ken, excellent um, research that's going on there. Ken has been involved with us for many years. Just a couple of things that we pulled out here for some research activities at Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago. If you want to participate in any of these research activities, we can link you in um, with Health Choice Network and or Alliance Chicago. And the Fenway Institute is also uh, partnering with another uh, research network that Health Choice Network is involved in. So there's all kinds of opportunities uh, for ongoing research, both for yourself as a clinician or a care team member or uh, your health center or on the individual patient level. So if we move to the next slide. So here's, um, I think, if there's anyone who has any questions, you can put them into the chat and we will uh, discuss them later. And then certainly I think we'll, we will be sending out all of the slides and um, an email. So if you have any questions of either uh, Ken Mayer or myself, let us know. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to one of our colleagues at Empower You, which is a community health center in Florida. And Angel, how are you? I know we've brought him. Great. Take it away. Hello, my name is Angel Camacho. I work at Empower Youth Healthcare Center. I'm literally coming back from the trenches. Um, we're having a uh, health fair today uh, for World AIDS Day, and I'm running in to present and running back to my prep tent. So I'm very happy to be here. First slide. A little history about Empower You. Empower You was established in 1999 in Liberty City, Florida, out of the need to provide culturally relative HIV services. The organization has grown from doing street outreach to educating the underserved communities about HIV and AIDS to becoming a federal qualified healthcare center. Next slide. Empower You's mission. Empower You maintains its mission to empower and educate, promote, and better health choices among historically underserved minority communities disproportionately impacted by health disparities. Our vision is equal access to healthcare service and provision of quality services to mitigate health disparities among historically minority communities. More than a job, Empower You is on a journey to provide holistic health services with his patients because healthy people create healthy communities. Next slide. HIV ser services provided at Empower You. We provide HIV STI screenings, HIV prevention, HIV linkage to care, primary care, behavior health, Ryan, Ryan White case management, part A and part C, test and treat services as well. Next slide, please. Our clientele in Miami, we service different, different um, populations. Um, we have our zip codes at 33127, 33142. Our zip code at Empower You is 33147, 33150. The community we serve, we serve 68% we serve of Black African Americans, 29% of Hispanic, and 2% of white. 
Our clientele profile is heterosexuals, LGBT, QA, community, cisgender, and transgenders, sex workers, non Hispanic, Latinx communities, and Haitian Creole. Next slide. Our providers are Empower You. We have three providers two physicians, one nurse, six medical assistants, one lab technician, five outreach staff, one prep navigator, which is me, two medical case managers, one peer educator, and two health practitioners. Next slide. Prep services that empower you. PrEP is a medicine for people at risk of HIV to take prevent getting from HIV from sex, sorry, <clears throat> HIV from, from getting, I'm going to start again, I'm so sorry. PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactis, is a medicine that people take for, for HIV to prevent from getting HIV from sex or injecting, injecting drug users. When taking as prescribed, PrEP is highly effective for prevent, preventing HIV. I'm sorry. Next slide. PrEP services that empower you. Empower you started providing services for PrEP in 2016. Clients were recruited through outreach and referrals. Outreach was a, outreach occurred during traditional and not traditional hours, taking places at high risk neighborhoods, bathhouses, adult bookstores, at the flea market or nightclubs. Next slide. Empower you services. We provide um, prep navigator services. Um, with the initial contact when a person is coming in for initial um, initiate prep services, we provide prep education, we schedule appointments, we work with the clients on client centered coordinated adherence, connect clients to community services here at Empower You. Next slide. Community barriers to accessing prep, social and, and, eco and economic inequality. Um, living in Miami, the cost of living is high. The cost of housing is high. Unemployment, limited social services is one of the barriers. Next slide, please. Community barriers to accessing PrEP. Changes and accessing, uh, sorry, changes and access to coverage. Uh, pushback from insurance companies is a big barrier. Patient receiving bills with hidden fees lack of access to care, lack of PrEP awareness in the community, community that is unaware of their risk of HIV and HIV stigma. Next slide, please. Community barriers to accessing PrEP, COVID. COVID-19 COVID has been a big barrier to accessing PrEP. Um, people who have, have had COVID um, with post-traumatic uh, syndrome, on mental health impact, substance abuse, low income or no income, losing their jobs, lack of transportation has been a barrier. Next slide, please. Strategies to increasing PrEP access. Strategies, in, strategies to increase access to PrEP. Initiate labs and follow up every three months. Labs, will be done and let's follow up with telehealth with the provider. Navigator prep linkage is very important. Services with holistic approach to patient care. Testing, STI, pre and STI prep the same day, initiating prep the same day with the HI or STI positive result. Find out what else is happening with the patient. Next slide. Strategies to increase access to PrEP. Normalizing the conversation for PrEP for all. Sexual, sexually healthy conversations. Commitment in organization trainings. Having trainings in organization. Outreach in traditional and non-traditional hours. Integrating self, sexual health in all patient visits. It's talking more about sexual health at the patient's visits. Next slide. So just the strategies, scale up education efforts, prep information in multiple language, create prep information in Spanish, English, and Creole in our community, more community education on prep, 
gender-specific se uh, sexual health clinics and, and wraparound services. These stigmatize PrEP, creating a hotline with PrEP navigators available. And for the future, more PrEP options than injectable PrEP. Thank you. So Angel, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate all of your words, but more importantly, really appreciate the work that you're doing. We're sorry you're taking you away from your World AIDS Day activities at your health center, but I do have one question. Um, so what in your, in your work that you're doing at Empower You, what keeps you coming back to work every day to do this work? Um, I, I love the work that I do. I love to have conversations with clients. I love the, the client-centered approach. Um, we, I love to do outreach and go out to the community and, and engage with people that do not know about PrEP. Um, as a PrEP navigator, um, coming into this community at Empower You, um, bringing a different uh, style, different approach, um, being of a Hispanic um, background, um, and engaging with communities that do not know about PrEP, do not know how to access PrEP, and bringing them into care, um, knowing, letting them know we, you know, we have a DMV in this neighborhood, and this is a busy um, North Side shopping center. is a is a flea market as well. So just going out to the community and giving the education makes me want to come back because I see clients coming in and getting into care, whether it's a uh, uh, HIV positive patient. Uh, a person that wants to know more about PrEP and, in, and initiating the PrEP and finding that they, they are here and that they want to be safe learning more, they want to come back to learn more, that makes me want to come back. Um, I, please excuse me, I, I was a little nervous and um, a little dry. Um, but yes, I, um, those are the, the reasons why I do come back every day to work. Thank you, Angel. I mean, yeah, you're you're doing phenomenal work, and we need more people uh, like you doing this work because I uh, firmly believe that we are going to be able to end the HIV epidemic. And it's people like you and people like Dr. Ken Mayer who are working tirelessly day in and day out um, on this subject, and truly, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you. And so on behalf of Health Choice Network and Alliance Chicago, I want to thank Dr. Kenneth Mayer for his great presentation and all of the, the, the years of work that Dr. Mayer has, has done. And I really appreciate working with him. And then Angel, thank you so much for your words and, and all of the thank commitment you. on a daily basis. So I hope everybody has a great day. We will be sending out the slides and the recording to our uh, World AIDS Day webinar. So thank you very much. On behalf of my colleagues, both uh, Antoinette Anwar and most importantly, Kwesi Willisey, we're doing such a phenomenal job of putting together today's webinar. So thank you, Kwesi. I hope everyone has a great day. Let's end the epidemic. Bye.